really what we're going to be trying to cover today with this class is kind of some basic terminology when it comes to oscilloscopes. Uh, we will be featuring the use of the Ford VCMM with the oscilloscope. The generic terms I'm talking about, however, do apply to any oscilloscope that you pick up. Uh, it just happens to be that this is the one we are using today. Thanks, Tyler. So uh, again, we're going to cover oscilloscope basics today and a lot of basic terminology. Uh, honestly, essentially, how are they hitched up? What are they used for? We'll answer some of those questions. What exactly is an oscilloscope? And we'll be talking about how to change some of the the minor adjustments in it, like your voltage range and your time, but we'll also be discussing some terminology like coupling, um, like slope, like triggering, um, that really help you understand more about the oscilloscope itself and what you can use it for, uh, for checking circuits uh, in all over our vehicles, as a matter of fact. So um, there will be some, I'll show you some tools, and we're going to do lots of demonstrations with our VMS software that integrates with our VCMM. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes, and uh, some sample things here on my desk where we'll cover um, and also some waveforms that were actually taken live on a car uh, we'll talk about them and how they can help you with diagnosis to try to get you you know a little bit thinking more creatively when you think about using an oscilloscope so um, I want to start out by talking about something that should be familiar to everybody on this telecast whether you're a student a dealer technician instructor whomever you are um, is a DVOM this is my favorite Fluke 87 right here that I that I use a lot. Now, um, when we're talking about automotive circuits, now I'm not talking about checking resistance today. I'm not talking about checking current draw today. I'm talking specifically about the voltage on the wires. What are some of the things that we can test with that DVOM? So actually, I'm going to ask that question right now. Throw me some responses back in that chat window right now and tell me what I can measure with that DVOM. What are some things that I can measure? I'm going to give you a clue. One of them is pretty easy, right? Uh, okay, I see voltage drop. I see, yep, okay, great. Um, I see uh, lots of good answers coming in now. So um, we can measure uh, our regular DC voltage, right? So uh, direct current voltage. Uh, I can also measure AC voltage with um, a DVOM, right? So specifically talking about voltages here. Now, there's also something, this actually says on the top, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but it says true RMS multimeter. Uh, RMS stands for root mean square. It actually indicates the way that the meter will measure AC voltages. So um, RMS usually means it will measure uh, not the full AC voltage potential. I'll give you an example. If I were to take the leads for this DVOM and stick it in my wall socket here at the house, uh, it's going to give me an AC voltage that's probably about 120 volts, right? Uh, it, however, if I were to hitch an oscilloscope up to that, you would actually see that the peaks of that voltage are really up around 170 volts. So RMS uh, means just it's, it's a calculation that the meter makes when it's measuring AC voltages, just so you kind of know what that is. All right. So um, what are some of the other things that we can measure talking about circuits in a vehicle and maybe circuits that turn on and off or they're digital? Well, um, we can measure peak voltage, right? So if I wanted to know uh, on a certain circuit how high that voltage was getting, I'll show you a sample one in a minute. Well, I can actually, usually most meters have a recording function called a min-max function of some sort, and that will tell me how high or low the voltage is going. Sometimes we use that to catch a glitch. If we think that the circuit may be, for instance, shorting to power intermittently, well, uh, I might allow the meter to go on there and record. Maybe it's recording at a maximum of five, and it might beep and say, oh, my gosh, you got 11 volts. So uh, that's another thing that we can measure with our meter. Um, we can measure frequency. All right, if you were on my vibration telecast a few weeks ago, we talked a lot about frequency. Uh, frequency as in, as in hertz or cycles per second. Uh, we can measure that in here. So if a signal is turning on and off, we can measure that with this. We can tell how, how, how often it is turning on and off. We can also measure its duty cycle. So when it is turning on and off, well, what percentage of the time is it on versus off? So those are kind of the basic things 
when we're talking about measuring voltages uh, on the circuit itself that we can actually do. I saw some other really good answers in there. Uh, voltage drop is a calculation that we can we can make with the meter and try to find out where resistance is. But again, I'm not talking about measuring resistance today. I'm not talking about measuring current flow today. We're talking about looking at voltage on circuits. Okay, so what I'm going to do here actually is I'm going to set up, um, show you kind of a picture of what I have going on. This is this is a picture of the desk over here on my right right now. And I'm going to set this meter up here now on a mystery circuit, okay? So I'll show you uh, kind of some of the things I have going on. I have, uh, my mystery circuit is actually right here contained in this board run by that 9 volt battery. So uh, it's it's a little uh, device that I got from actually Fluke, um, geez, probably about, I don't know, 25 years ago when I was an instructor uh, at, a, at a training center. So uh, it put out, puts out some digital um, circuits that we're going to actually try to measure here today with both the meter and the oscilloscope. Um, I also have over here, I'll do this a couple of times today, this is a signal generator. Uh, this will actually generate both AC and DC signals. I can change the speed of them, I can change the amplitude of them, um, I can change what they look like, so we'll use that today. And I'm also going to use this booster pack. It's kind of powering things over here today and making sure they're running well and everything. So, And I've got a, a, a neat coupling demo later on that I'll do with that booster pack. So that's what the setup looks like over here to my right. So if you're wondering what I'm doing over here when I'm setting things up, well, that's what I'm doing. So I'm actually going to... Uh, turn this meter on now and Tyler if you wouldn't mind taking some notes for me because I won't remember these numbers that would be very helpful so yeah. I have um, right now I am dialed up I don't know if you can see my meter there on DC volts on that circuit and I am measuring Tyler I'm gonna call it 1.6 volts now one other thing if you can see it on my screen there there's a little bar graph display down here on the bottom now that little bar down there is moving right now so that probably tells me that there's something else going on with that that I can't see here with this meter display right now. Does that make sense? And remember, what is this meter showing me right now on DC voltage? Well, is it showing me the maximum DC voltage? Absolutely not. It's showing me an average voltage right now of what is on that circuit. So the average voltage is 1.6 volts. Um, I'm going to flip it to AC for a second. And I'm getting a little bit of a different reading there. So that is on AC volts now. You can see on my dial. And AC volts, Tyler, I'm getting about 2.2, we'll call it. So 2.2 volts AC. Hey, Craig. Now, yes. We, uh, we're we having a little bit of trouble seeing the screen. Could you maybe try putting it a little bit closer to the camera? I can try. Can you see that? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay, I'll try that. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So... Um, I'm back to DC volts right now, and what I want to know is how high and how low is that DC volts going. Now, uh, I mentioned a feature a couple of seconds ago called min-max. I'm going to activate that on this meter right here. So I can hit this button right here that's labeled min-max, and it's now recording. Here are the beeps. I don't know if you heard them or not. Um, I'm going to actually hit peak min-max. That makes it go faster. So it's actually showing right there. Can you see that? 8 volts maximum, Tyler. Yep. And minimum is going darn near zero, 0 0.44 volts. Okay, so we're starting to get a picture of what this looks like maybe, right? So it has an average voltage DC of 1.6. It has a maximum voltage of 8. It has a minimum voltage of near zero. So this circuit is turning on and off, right? But on the average, it's pretty low. What are some other things I can check? We mentioned frequency. Um, here is the frequency number right here. I press this little button over here that says Hertz. And your frequency, I'm going to call it 80. It's 79.44. We're going to call it 80 hertz. And I'm going to hit it again. And it gives me my duty cycle, percent on time. So my percent on time on this circuit, Tyler, is 13. Okay? So what I want to do is I'm going to actually uh, get back to my presentation over here. And I've got a blank screen. And... Let's discuss for a second what we think this digital signal looks like based on the measurements we have taken. Okay, so um, so I'm going to draw a little graph of it, okay? So, and on this graph, on the left-hand side here, this x-axis, I'm going to call this voltage, okay? Now, uh, and we're going to call this time. So, we know it was darn near zero volts at a minimum and close to eight at a maximum. So that sounds to me like it's switching on and off from zero to eight, right? 
Now, it also only has, uh, Tyler, was it a 13% duty cycle? Yep, 13. Okay, so here's what that means to me, and, and somebody please chime in if you think I'm wrong. So it's off for quite a while, and then it turns on, and it goes to about 8 volts right here, right? This being 0 volts down here. But it's on for a very short period of time, then it shuts off again, and it goes along for a while. And then it turns on again. And I'm kind of drawing a DC pulse between 0 and 8 volts here. Every kind of follow what I'm doing? So based on the measurements that we've taken, I think this is what it looks like. Um, let's talk a little bit about the time base down there. What was the frequency, Tyler? The frequency was 80 hertz. Um, 80 hertz. Yep. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means it's doing this signal here on this screen 80 times a second. That's pretty fast, right? That is that is a pretty fast signal. But based on what I'm, I'm measuring with the meter, in my mind right now, and please somebody chime in if you think I'm wrong, I think this is what this circuit looks like. It's going between 0 and 8. It has an average voltage of about 1.6, right? It has a 13% on time, and therefore it has a 80, what, 7% off time, right? And it's really fast. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do right here now before I start sharing my screen, I'm going to swap over in just a second. I'm going to put the oscilloscope on it, all right? And we're going to see what this thing actually looks like. So give me a second to get that over there. See if I can do that. Okay, it's coming up on the screen here now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing the presentation here for a second. Let me turn my pen off first so I don't forget to do that. All right, now I'm going to go show you what it looks like on my oscilloscope screen. Don't worry too much about what the oscilloscope is or does right now, but I'm just going to show you a picture of this signal and what it actually looks like. Okay, can you see that there now, folks? That's not exactly what I drew, is it? Not exactly what I drew. However, I am seeing, um, well, um, I'm seeing that it goes between uh, a 0 and 5 volt pulse right here. But remember there was some AC on that. We'll talk about that a little bit later on and how it was coupled. Um, truth be told, this is really an AC voltage signal and the DC voltage I uh, can't really see all of that. So, um, but it actually has some variable height pulses in it, right? I really couldn't see that with my voltmeter. Um, it is moving really fast. Um, each one of these scale divisions here right now is 20 milliseconds. So that is turning on and off a lot. So I kind of believe that uh, 80 hertz frequency number. But so there's only so much, my point is, there's only so much that you can tell when you're measuring a digital circuit with a DVOM, okay? An oscilloscope is really kind of the best way to go. Now, I'm going to uh, move back over to my presentation here and show you one other item that uh, especially uh, my coworkers and my dealer technicians may be surprised about this one. So, um, all right, so that's what I thought my mystery signal looked like. It didn't look like that at all, right, based off the measurements that I took? Okay, so... This here, and I'm going to ask my coworkers on this call right now, does anybody know what this is? This actually was measured on my aviator out in the driveway this morning, and I will give you that tip. Even my coworkers here, you tell me if you know what that is. That uh, alternator ripple? Uh, no, that is, that's a good guess, but it is not. It, notice it's going from 0 to 5 volts. That the throttle position sensor looks like on my aviator. This does not have the traditional potentiometer with three wires, a 5-volt reference, a ground, and a signal wire that has a swipe mechanism on the inside. A lot of cars still have that. They've been making them for decades. The car out in the driveway does not have that. This is what the throttle position sensor signal looks like on that. Now, you tell me how I am going to diagnose that with this. How am I going to do that? So um, I just kind of want to show you that, you know, it is becoming a necessity to learn these skills today that we are talking about on this call because cars are becoming more and more complex as we go along. And I don't know how to tell you 
how to actually diagnose that circuit and see if there is some sort of intermittent problem with it without using an oscilloscope. Sir, I saw min-max come up. Yes, you can use min-max. That will tell you that the voltage is going up and down. Yes, I can check frequency. It'll tell me that it actually is, has a certain speed, but if it has a minute glitch in it, I'm never going to see it with frequency. I'm not going to see it with min-max. I'm not going to see it with duty cycle. Okay, so um, what I'm trying to say is that an oscilloscope is becoming a very, very important tool. Okay, so first of all, let's talk for a minute again about what is an oscilloscope. This actually comes out of a dictionary definition. So it says it's a device for viewing oscillations. Well, that's kind of where the name came from. It views oscillations of electrical voltage or current. We're talking about voltage today. How can I show current? Well, I can show current. We've done this in a couple of classes before by using an inductive current clamp around a wire, and this outputs voltage, okay? So my oscilloscope can measure. It'll show me varying voltage, but it really means current. Um, we have some current adapters for the VCMM as well that you've seen Tyler use before, for instance, in the battery drain video and so forth. So, um, And it's uh, by a display on a, on a cathode ray tube. Now, um, the original ones were all analog, and let me show you. Um, this was not... My first oscilloscope, this is actually, can you see that, Tyler, okay? So this was actually my second oscilloscope, and honestly, it is still one of my favorite oscilloscopes. I got this thing back in the mid-1990s. I bought it used, um, and I still use it today, as a matter of fact. This is a true analog oscilloscope. It does not, what does that mean? So um, very much like this definition says right here, uh, it has a small television in there with a cathode ray tube that actually projects on the screen, and that's how it actually depicts the waveforms on it. Um, I can actually freeze those waveforms, but you know, if, if a glitch happens on that and I go to hit the freeze button, it's gone. All right. So, um, however, it has really great resolution. If I'm looking for a problem with, for instance, a fuel injector driver, and I want to see if there is an issue with it, um, a lot of what happens today, and we'll talk about digital storage oscilloscopes, there's a lot of interference on those. Not with that thing. Um, extremely clear picture. So if I'm trying to diagnose something like a serial data circuit um, or look for intermittent glitches, that thing is awesome. Problem is, um, like I said, I can't record it. So um, I couldn't take it on a test drive and I felt something, you know, look, go back and look at the recording. So analog oscilloscopes are kind of, um, they're a piece of lab equipment. Uh, they are still awesome. Um, I love this thing, but it really doesn't have a place in diagnosing vehicles on an everyday basis. So what are we using today? Um, this, right here is happens to be uh, my another one of my oscilloscopes. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a Fluke 199C. It actually is a two channel. Uh, it has different colors on it. Um, I got this thing probably about 10 years after I got that other one. Um, a digital storage oscilloscope, let's put the definition up. Basically what it does is it has an analog scope on the inside of it, okay? And it takes a sample Every, I'm going to say 100 milliseconds. I'm picking a number here. So, but that's a lot of times, right? So um, every 100 milliseconds, um, actually, I actually think this takes it actually every like 1.5 milliseconds. It's pretty fast. Um, so that's like, you know, almost a, it's a thousand times per second, right? So um, uh, kilosecond, excuse me. So anyway, yeah, it takes a lot of pictures. And what it does, it plots those out. So a digital storage oscilloscope takes samples and it plots it out. Um, Therefore, the waveforms, when you're looking at really fine, look a little bit more ragged because it really is connecting the dots on the screen. It's really drawing it for you. But what it allows us to do is have that recording feature. So, uh, again, if I know I have a problem with my, I don't know, I'm going to say throttle position sensor circuit, and I have the oscilloscope running next to me on the seat, and I feel something, and it sets a code, I can reach down, punch a button, I can record what just happened, and I can go back and review it. Okay, so um, a lot of flexibility, um, a lot of capability of uh, uh, saving sample waveforms and saving setups for those sample waveforms and everything. So um, most of what we're seeing used in the automotive industry today is some sort of a digital storage oscilloscope. What we are using uh, in Ford, and Tyler, do you have your VCMM right there, sir? You could hold it up. Tyler's going to hold up his VCMM. So that is our interface, thanks Tyler, um, for um, our leads. So we have leads that uh, we plug in. I'll unplug one of them right now. Um, it's just going to plug into that VCMM. On the other end, it has alligator clips for power and ground. Okay, uh, the VCMM through a cord wires into a PC and it utilizes software on the PC to become a digital storage oscilloscope. 
Okay, that's what a lot of the preferred oscilloscopes on the market are today, because you have the full power of a PC um, for its memory capabilities, its recording capabilities, uh, its battery capabilities are actually pretty cool too. So uh, that's really the more popular way to use an oscilloscope today. There's a bunch of different brands out there uh, for it happens to use the VCMM. Um, so that's the one we're going to be talking about today a little bit. All right, so some basic familiarization with the oscilloscope screen uh, that we were on just a minute ago. So we're going to talk about voltage scaling and the time base for just a minute here. Let me go to this next picture. So um, very much like I drew that graph. Remember when I drew that sample graph a couple of minutes ago? Um, on the left-hand side of the screen right here is the voltage scale. It actually says it right here. It's really small. Sorry. Uh, and on this down here is the time scale. Now, um, right now, I, I really faint. <laughs> Um, but there's some grid lines in here. I'll kind of draw over some of them. There's a grid line there. There's a grid line there. There's a grid line there. And there's a grid line here and a grid line here and a grid line here. Okay, so anyway, there's a grid line on the oscilloscope. And what it means is telling me on the left-hand side right here that every grid line on this side is worth 2 volts. See, there's 8, there's 10, so every one is worth 2 volts. Down here on the time scale, it tells me it's 20 milliseconds per division. So each one of these boxes down here... 20 milliseconds. This next one, 20 milliseconds. So really what it's doing is it's taking the voltage that it sees on that circuit and plotting it over time for me. Okay? So the setup is no different than your voltmeter, right? We're grounding the voltmeter and we're putting the power lead, usually, on the circuit that we want to measure. That's exactly the same thing we're doing with the oscilloscope. It's exactly the same setup. But what the oscilloscope is doing for us here, the digital storage one, is drawing us a picture, really, right? So it is making those measurements. It is drawing a picture of what that circuit is actually doing. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so um, oscilloscope really is, you know, nothing more than making a very highly detailed graph for us of voltage over time. Okay, now, I'm going to do a little bit of a demo here now um, about um, voltage over time. I'm going to let me let me set up over here a little bit uh, just to make sure that I am on the right circuit. All right, so I have this one here. I want to go here. My ground side. I want to make sure I'm over there. I get my signal up here. Okay, and I'm just going to make one change before you see the screen here. All right, so when I first started using oscilloscopes, I mean, very often when I powered up my oscilloscope and I put it on a circuit and I didn't know what that circuit was supposed to look like, I might end up with something that looked like this. Now, I'm, I'm totally lost at this point. What the heck is this circuit? What's going on? So um, I can see, again, I know on the left-hand side here I have voltage. Uh, on the bottom here I have time. I knew that. I had learned that. Um, I have a little bit of an indicator here on the left saying that, well, there's more voltage on this than I can actually see. Okay, see this little arrow up here? So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to actually see if I can find the top of that. I'm going to change this. It's on 2 volts per division right now. I'm going to try to change that to 4. I can do that over here on this drop-down menu. Okay, so now it's showing me all of it. That arrow went away, so I know that now I'm seeing something that's between 0 and 12 volts. All right? Now, what I can't see is a lot of detail in that right now because it's going super fast. Um, and my time scale, I know you can't read it down here, it's actually on 100 milliseconds per division. So I'm going to actually move that to 20 milliseconds per division. Okay, there we go. Now I'm actually seeing that this thing is turning on and off, right? So this is a digital square wave. It is going between 0 and 12 volts, and it's turning on and off a lot, right? Well, if I want to see a little bit more detail on that, I can just go to 10 milliseconds. See what I just did? All I did was change the time base on the bottom of that screen, and I can see a little bit more detail on that now, okay? So that's how you can start taking a look at the at the signal and get that base pattern you just start playing a little bit with those voltage and time scales and pay attention you know oh it's going off or uh, my scale needs to be wrong by the way if i need to move this on the screen um, there's ways that you can move the position so this channel right here what i like want to do is uh, tyler can you see those grid lines in the background there or is it too too faint 
Yeah, I can see him. Fine. Okay, so what I just did, folks, is I tried to put the channel right on the grid line. So that actually helps me measure it. See what I'm saying? So if I put my zero reference right here, right now it's off the grid. I'll put it right on a grid line. So I know this level's four, this is eight, and uh, this is 12. So it's actually just a little bit over 12 volts, it looks like here. Okay. So, um, and the, uh, we'll talk about some of the other things on this screen just in a second. One other thing I want to show you, um, let's say, for instance, let me change the time base on this here. Uh, we're going to go and make them really wide. All right, so let's say I wanted to know uh, how long was a cycle, a cycle meaning on and then off again. So I can go to this little function down here called cursors and turn it on, uh, and it'll make these little lines down here. So let's say I want to measure a cycle on this. So I can go from here. Oops, let me go the other way. I'll put A over here. I'll put B over here. That's the end of the cycle, okay? Now I got some numbers over here. It says from X to A, it is 8.7 milliseconds. From X to B, it is 12 milliseconds, but the difference between the two of them is 3.3 milliseconds. So that means from here to here, that measurement of time is 3.3 milliseconds. That's actually pretty cool. So if I, for instance, had a fuel injector pattern up here and I wanted to see what the pulse width or the on time was, I could actually measure it with cursors on the screen. Um, and again, that's that cursor function down there. I'm going to shut that back off here now. Okay, so let me go back and uh, share my other screen with a presentation in it here. So that's kind of, you know, the basics of uh, voltage and time scales. All right. So coming back to my presentation now. All right, so we saw the cursor function uh, for measuring that just a second ago. Okay, so um, that's the basics of setting up voltage and time. Now, I want to talk about something called trigger. What is trigger? So triggering gives you a really kind of like a stable display. Um, so it has uh, like a similar uh, point that it starts out every single time it starts drawing that graph. Okay. Um, so basically what it is, you're setting a voltage level that you want it at before it will start drawing that picture or plotting out that picture. Okay, now um, I just want to let you know that sometimes it's referenced uh, as a voltage level on the screen. Sometimes it can be external. Some oscilloscopes, uh, like my Fluke down there, I can actually use this device. It goes around a spark plug wire. I can use that spark plug input as a trigger. See what I'm saying? So it won't start drawing what I have on the other channel on the oscilloscope until it sees a trigger out of this. That makes sense? So let's say I want to. Um, <clears throat> refer to uh, an ignition pattern that's on the screen. I want to know where number one cylinder is. Stick this on number one cylinder, then I can count it off in firing order. So that may be one example that you would use an external trigger. VCMM doesn't allow me too much flexibility for external triggers, however. Okay, so this next thing I want to talk about is slope. Now, uh, this is actually a pretty easy definition, but a lot of people get, get tripped up on it. So um, the signal, the digital signal that we just looked at a second ago, um, it actually had a positive slope and it had a negative slope. Now, just let me say what I'm talking about. So the positive slope would be when the signal looked like this. It was rising. That is a positive slope. I'm going to put a P above it. Um, and on the other side of it, when it started going down, that is a negative slope or falling. Some of some oscilloscopes call it rising and falling, but that would be what the slope is. Now, um, we'll talk about why that's important in just a second, but let me actually give you an example of trying to stabilize um, what the pattern looks like, okay? So I'm going to get a pattern up here and uh, see if we can actually do that. Get some uh, pattern adjusted here. Okay, where am I at? I'm going to change a couple of things here before I share my screen. Okay, so let's do this. All right, so I'm going to let that run. We're going to stop sharing this one and come over here. Okay, so I have a digital signal on here. Again, it's turning on and off, and it's turning on and off between 
Uh, looks like zero and four volts to me. Does everybody agree with that? I have those numbers over here on the left. This is zero, that is four, and it is turning on and off. I have 20 milliseconds per division down here, but you see what I mean that the, the, the pattern is not really stable here right now. Sometimes it looks like it's going up. Sometimes it looks like it's going down, but really what the thing is, I'm not seeing the whole thing here, okay? So <clears throat> what I can do to actually fix that is I can do a couple of things. So I'm going to actually go down here where it says trigger. I know you can't read that. And I'm going to go from auto. Up on the top here it says trigger mode auto. I'm going to change that. I'm going to go actually to normal trigger. And I'm going to adjust my trigger point. So this cursor right here, uh, what I just did, that where it's, it's a little T. You probably can't see that very well. But I just slid up my little T. It's not triggering right there because the T is below where the circuit is at. If I go up a little bit, when it goes above zero, it should start triggering. Okay, good. And apparently it is on a rising slope. Right down here in the corner, it says rising. Okay, remember that positive or rising slope we just talked about? So it is triggering on a rising slope. Let's change it to negative. Okay, so let's change it to a falling slope. I didn't do it. I picked the wrong one. There it is. Okay, so now it's triggering on a falling slope. See the difference? Okay, so a negative or falling slope. So um, what the trigger point um, allows me to do is, um, again, find uh, a, a location to stabilize the view that I'm looking at. And I can decide whether I want to look at it rising or falling. I'll give you a couple examples of that in a second. I'm going to go back to rising and give you a pretty good example, however, of how I can find our intermittent in this circuit. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to move my trigger point intentionally above where my pattern is actually. I'm going to see if I get it to disappear. What it's done is it's frozen because it didn't see anything on there. All right, I'm going to leave it right there. So I'm not seeing anything on the screen right now because I moved my trigger here above the four volts, right? Let's say I suspected that this circuit had a short to power. I'm going to go create one right now. See if I can get to the right side of my battery here. All right, should be this side right here. Now let me see if I can quickly create a short to power. Oh, look at that. All right, so um, what I just did, now notice where it's at, folks. Um, it must have been going along that high side, that 4-volt side when I shorted it, but boom, it went up to 9 volts. Well, actually, that happens to be the 9-volt battery I'm powering it with, right? But we didn't see anything at all because I set my trigger point above that. I was looking for a short to power. I just saw one right here, right? So I can capture it by adjusting the trigger point. Okay, so it'll do basically nothing until there's a problem. This is kind of a way to catch a glitch. See what I'm saying? Okay, um, so let me just go back down here again and turn it back on to normal running. There we go. It's again on a positive or rising slope uh, in a trigger level here. By the way, if I wanted to move this so I could measure time base, this one down here also moves. So I can set it over here so the trigger will start at that location on the graph instead of the original one. So I did it again that by moving the little trigger thing down here. Okay. Um, it helps me align things, so if I want to use those grid marks to measure stuff, it makes it a little bit easier. Okay, um, some of the other things that we can do, um, let me move this over here. Um, if I go down to the trigger options, there's one down here that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, there's one called missing pulse. Now, I'm going to show you why this is one of my favorite things, and those of you who watched my ignition telecast the webinar last week. Um, I want to show you one thing that's really cool about that. So let's see if I can actually, and eh, we'll try this one. Okay, so this will work. This is a sample waveform from a five liter Mustang. Um, what we're looking at here on the bottom in yellow is the crankshaft position sensors, and the upper two are uh, camshaft position sensors. I don't know if they're intake or exhaust. I didn't really pay attention. But if you remember last week from the, what we talked, ignition crank sensor reluctor actually has uh, a missing tooth. So um, what I can do is actually I can trigger it on that missing tooth. It says uh, missing pulse. One of the ways I can trigger it. That's what they did when they did this. So it shows up every single time. 
Uh, I'll just scroll through them here. The pictures all look the same. I'm scrolling down the bottom of the screen, you can see, because they triggered it the same way every time. But it's a great way to get that relationship. Other than that, what's going to be happening, that signal's going to be going all over the screen, right, and not be stable. So with triggering it on a certain pulse, I can lock it on that location and compare it and do my job much easier than waiting for it to uh, align just right and look at it. So trigger is a pretty powerful thing. Slope is a pretty powerful thing as well. So, uh, Tyler, uh, do we have any questions that have come in on trigger and slope? Folks, if you have questions on them, ask them now, because uh, I really kind of want to address them now. Uh, no questions so okay. far. I don't see any hands um, and raised. But, okay. um, I, cool. you know, maybe could you go back and kind of go over that last example again of how you would use trigger to identify maybe a intermittent fault? Okay, so um, I have it running up on the screen here again. Let me share it. So trigger to find an intermittent fault. Um, uh, again, this is running right now. You should be seeing that, that screen right there. I've set the trigger level, so it is definitely within range. Um, if I'm looking for a, uh, a short to power, for instance, what I will do is I will put that trigger piece above that. Now, it just happened to freeze. It's no longer running. I know you probably can't see that. It's just showing me the last thing that it displayed. I'm going to try to catch it when it's not displaying anything because it actually makes the picture work a little bit better. There we go. It's not ca It's not showing anything right there. So it is still running in the background, but the oscilloscope is not triggered right now. It's not starting to draw because I set that trigger point above the normal value for that circuit. Does that make sense, Tyler? Did I explain that well? Yeah. So nothing okay, so so what I'm going to do here again is I'm going to create a short, pardon me for reaching over, that is above that 4 volts, okay? So there we go. There is a short that was above the 4 volts. It triggered because it saw it go above it, right? It went up to 9, and it drew it for me. So again, that's a, a way to use trigger, a powerful way to use trigger to find an intermittent glitch. You can do the same thing if you think the circuit is shorting to ground. I can't do that as well right here. Um, but let's say it's supposed to be a 5-volt reference circuit. We have those running all over cars, right? Well, if I think the 5-volt reference circuit is shorting to ground, um, I can put the trigger below that 5 volts. And when it sees it go down to that, I can catch it. So it can use you can use it backwards is the way I'm demonstrating it here as well. Did that clear it up, Tyler? Yeah, so if you were just doing a short to ground, you would basically set the trigger or trigger at zero volts. Right? Yeah, so I mean, you know, a 5-volt reference pattern is pretty boring, folks, right? It just sits there and does 5 volts all the time, right? So if I set it up, for instance, at 4 volts, it would never plot anything until that short to ground happened. Then all of a sudden it would plot something, and I would catch a glitch, and I would prove that it was going below 5 volts. See what I'm saying? Cool. Excellent questions. Anything else? I think we're uh, good to continue. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. So I'm going to go back to the presentation over here that we had. Uh, we have one more major terminology to talk about, but I have a, a pretty good example here of slope for a second. So on the next slide right here, um, I did the demo. We saw that it did consistent patterns. We saw how we could catch shorts with it. Uh, we, um, I didn't show you, you can actually uh, trigger off different channels. Um, that's kind of important. Let me go back and show you that kind of quick here. It's actually pretty easy to do. So I'm going to turn another channel on on the oscilloscope right now and put another pattern up. So let me swap this trigger down here. So that one's running in the background. Let me get the second channel right here. I'm going to put it on another circuit on this thing. Uh, turn the second channel on. Okay, good. So I have two channels there, but that one's going off screen. Let me do a little voltage adjustment to that, right? So we can see the whole thing. So that should bring it in. All right, there we go. So I just did a quick little voltage adjustment to that second one. Okay, so right now, um, down here it says I'm actually triggering on the channel one. Um, channel two, by the way, its numbers show up over here on the right. See what I'm saying? And if I wanted to reposition that, I could do it right here, slide it up and down on the right-hand side. Okay. Now, it looks like I'm getting uh, four pulses for every one pulse I'm getting on channel one. It's four times as fast. Um, I can change the trigger on this thing down here so I can trigger it on channel two. So what it just did there, it, it, it picked an automatic spot for me here based on the other one for the trigger point on channel two. Now, uh, although channel two looks kind of stable right now, 
Channel 1 is no longer stable. Why is that? Why do you think it's marching along like that, folks? There's a good question for you. Why is that marching along? And the answer is actually kind of pretty simple. Um, there are four pulses, right, for every one of those big ones. It could be picking any one of those four pulses to trigger on. So if I really want to see something that's stable, if I'm comparing these two signals for some reason, say one's a crank and one's a cam or something, I probably want to trigger it on the bigger one. So I'm going to go back to channel one for a second here. All right, so I'm triggering on channel one right now. It happens to plot channel two at the same time, and it shows me a consistent pattern. All right, if I wanted to see more of them, I could just go to... 50 milliseconds per division, for instance, and I can get a little better picture as to what that looks like in total. Um, do you remember that crank and cam one that, that was up just a minute ago? They actually adjusted that so you could see the full revolution of the crankshaft and compare the cam sensors as they were going along. Just by changing this time base right here, they put more events on the screen. Okay, so that was triggering on multiple channels. I apologize for not showing you that uh, a second ago. But uh, it's kind of an important thing to realize it can be done. Okay. That's why I put this stuff in the presentation. All right, so one other thing to talk about on um, trigger. So this pattern right here is actually uh, the typical port fuel injector. Now, um, I want to see some answers on this one, folks. What do you think would be the best way to trigger this one? And what I'm talking about is slope, I should say. What is the best slope to pick? Would I want to trigger it on a rising or falling slope? So I see negative slope. That's actually the answer I was looking for. So a falling or negative slope. Yes, that is correct. So um, let me give you a little familiarity with this right here. So this is actually zero volts right here. This is actually probably charging volts, about 14. Um, so what I'm on here in that port fuel injector, there's only two wires, right? Um, it's got permanent battery power on one wire. The other one is the control wire that comes out of the PCM. That's the one we're back probed on here. So it's just kind of cruising along here at 14 volts with the car running until it turns the injector on. When it turns the injector on, it could go down to zero volts, right? What is this time right here? What do we call that? Well, we call that injector pulse width. That's the amount of time that the injector is on. Um, I've actually used this before. We This is not a measurement that you can get on every vehicle, on every scan tool. So if I want to know, for instance, that it has an input problem, let's say the map sensor on this F-150 that we're working on is skewed and the car is running a little rich and it's setting a rich code, I can go take a look at the pulse width on this injector, but I'd have to have a known good truck near me. I could also measure it on, same operating conditions, same engine, same temperature. And I can see what the pulse width is on that one. Say, well, yeah, geez, this pulse width on this one is 30% wider. So it has an input somewhere telling it to be that wide. That makes sense? So that's the pulse width. Uh, this is where the injector shuts off. Really, an injector is a solenoid, right? It's a, it's, it's a bunch of wire wraps uh, creating magnetism around a pintle that opens and closes, okay? So this is where it shuts off. It gets an inductive kick when it shuts off. Notice that it's up to about, this is, says fi nearly 50 volts over here. I know you can't read that, but uh, this is probably about 48 volts or so. Uh, this, by the way, is a good way to tell the health of the winding in that injector. Okay, so again, I have eight injectors on this F-150. I don't know exactly how big the kick should be on every vehicle made in America and uh, around the world, but I do know that it should be the same as the other seven injectors on that F-150, so I can check another one. So again, this inductive kick right here should be similar to the other injectors in the same operating condition. Tells me a lot about the winding. Um, when this comes back down, actually, I'm going to exaggerate it right here. There's a little bit of a bump right there where it comes down. Believe it or not, that is actually the pintle coming back down through the magnetic field, so it is normal to see a little bit of a bump right there in that location. And uh, it was answered correctly a second ago. I want to actually trigger this thing on a negative slope, right? So the slope that looks like this, okay, or a falling slope is what it was called on the VCMM, because that gets me the best picture of this fuel injector. So again, uh, and, and a stable pattern, by the way, because if I wasn't using it, it was auto-triggering, that thing would be everywhere on the screen. It would be all over the place. Did you see the difference? When we triggered it, it held it in one spot, and I could look at it. So it's actually a really nice skill to understand how to use. So that is triggering and slope. All right, cool. Um, 
last thing we're going to talk about as far as basic terminology is coupling. Um, so this is a little bit of, uh, I'll call it a little bit more of an advanced concept. Definitely, if I'm looking at a circuit that is known to be AC, I want to AC couple the oscilloscope. If I'm looking at a circuit that is known to be DC, I usually want to DC couple the oscilloscope. But let me tell you really what it is. Coupling kind of tells you or tells the um, oscilloscope how you want to measure the voltage and how you want it displayed. Okay, so here's the difference. If you couple the scope DC, it's going to try to show you the entire amount of voltage on the screen. Okay, so let's say you are on a 12 volt circuit. It's going to try to show you all 12 volts on the screen. All right, now if you put it on that same 12 volt circuit and you couple it AC, really what it's going to do um, is show you what may be on that circuit for minor fluctuations. It will not show you the entire voltage from top to bottom. So um, you're probably wondering what the heck purpose is that in the first place? It's really for looking at minor fluctuations in a circuit that you just can't see when you're measuring on DC. And yeah, it was weird. So here's some real waveforms. So here's what I did. Um, I took the two leads, uh, there's two leads there powering up the VCMM, the other two leads are the power and negative going to the battery when the vehicle was operating. Now I uh, AC coupled the oscilloscope and this is what I got. What's up now? Okay, so sorry. Um, let me start, over, start that again. Um, so again, uh, we're only seeing it's about 10 millivolts right here on this bracket on the left hand side because uh, it's 100 millivolts per division. And if it gets up to this line right here at 250 millivolts, it's a problem. So again, there's three to eight diodes on the inside of this alternator. And I can see there's some repeat patterns here. I started to draw this line and this line and this line and this line and this line. Those are all repeat patterns, right? And really uh, this line and this line and this line and this line, all repeat patterns. What I'm looking at here, folks, these are the diodes on the inside of the charging system that is rectifying that AC voltage into DC. Now there's a little bit of a ripple in them and, and a little bit of ripple like this, I'm gonna kind of go like that is normal. But if I have a line that goes on this one up every time and on this one up every time and or up every time or down, it could be either way, uh, that is a bad diode in the charging system. And if it exceeds, this threshold of about 250 millivolts right there, it starts causing problems with computers. Usually those little ripples that are in the system, they're just absorbed by the battery. Everything's just fine and honky dory, but the battery can absorb things that are above about a quarter of a volt. Okay, so the only way I'm going to see that is to AC couple the oscilloscope and look at those very fine fluctuations in the circuit. Okay, um, so let me give you another example of that here actually. So. The next example here is actually, I'm going to go to the signal wire on the MAP sensor, the manifold absolute pressure sensor. Everybody knows that's in the intake manifold. The intake manifold's under vacuum, right? Okay. Um, uh, when it's when the vehicle is running approximately, you know, maybe 1.2, 1.5 volts or something like that in the MAP sensor when the vacuum is low at idle, it's actually a pretty good place to check it. Here is my setup. Actually, let me go to the previous diagram there for a second. I know that I want to be on the map signal wire, so I want to be on this violet and gray wire right here. Okay, so I'm going to try to locate that on the map sensor in the next drawing. All right, so um, computer is about ready to restart. Let me shut that down. I have just, uh, looks like I have 27 minutes. <laughs> I got something going on. I'm good. Um, so again, next drawing. I back probed the violet with gray wire right there with my uh, my lead. This is actually my positive lead. My negative lead is over there on the battery still. And this is the signal I got. It looks like a bunch of junk right now, but let me try to explain what's going on. So this is the map sensor, again, AC coupled. Um, the first thing I want you to see is there is a underlying digital pulse on this circuit, underlying. If you look above it right now, I'm kind of drawing right below it. Can you see that, folks? Tyler, can you see that? There's an underlying digital pulse in that. Right there, and right there, and right there, and right 
there, right there. And there's a second pattern in there too. There's a peak. See those peaks, folks? Tyler, you see those peaks? All right, so. I can see them, Greg. All right, so there's two patterns in this thing. Now, um, is there any guesses as to what these are? This is kind of an advanced question. So let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for about 10 seconds here, and you tell me if you have any guesses as to what those are. Two distinct patterns in there and a bunch of interference. Really kind of the way that it's being plotted out. All right, give you about another five seconds. All right, so um, here is what we have. Um, this pulse right here is the EVAP purge solenoid turning on and off and changing the pressure in that intake manifold. So the EVAP purge solenoid is turning on and off. Uh, again, it's drawing a vacuum intermittently on the EVAP system in this thing, trying to suck some of that gasoline in. That's what that pattern is. Anybody have any idea what this pattern is right here? That is every time a set of intake valves is opening up and the pressure is dropping inside that intake manifold. So you're thinking, big deal, Craig. What are you trying to show me here? Well, let's say I had a car came in with a misfire. It took me literally two minutes to set this up and get this pattern. Now, if I saw that I had one, two, three, four, five good pulses, and this one was, whoops, I advanced my slide. Sorry, let me go back. Didn't have my pen on anymore. I thought I did. So again, one, two, three, four, five, and this one was smaller or missing, and it went to the same pattern again. Well, I just proved out that I have a mechanical problem. That my misfire in this vehicle that just came in with me right now has, for some reason, not sucking air in that one cylinder right there. I don't know which one it is based on this, but I know that there's a mechanical problem. Uh, usually the vehicles tell us today where which cylinder the problem is in, correct? So that is actually a super fast way to do a mechanical check uh, to see if I need to go start checking mechanical or if I need to start checking spark and fuel. Because I can have spark and fuel being sprayed in that cylinder. If it's not mechanical, this pattern is going to look bad. If it's, excuse me, if it has a mechanical problem, that pattern is going to look bad. So, um, Again, it's kind of an advanced thing. Um, when we're talking about uh, AC coupling, we're looking for those fine variations on a circuit. I'm sorry my demo didn't work. It actually worked pretty good when we tried it out yesterday, but I have to figure out what's going on there. But that's what we're looking for, fine things happening on a circuit. Okay, so um, that's it for the oscilloscope basics today. We talked about the voltage and time scaling. We talked about coupling, that last piece. We talked about triggering and making the, the pattern more stable. And we talked about slope, positive and negative, the way that you want the thing to start drawing on that trigger, okay? So those are kind of the basic things you need to know to run any oscilloscope. 